Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal, in-depth exploration of well-being. I'm deeply convinced that understanding the science and practice of well-being is the key to living a healthier, more joyful, and more meaningful life. Join me as I learn and share the most inspiring insights about human flourishing from leading experts in the field. So I actually have two guests on the podcast today. My first guest is Jan Besner, an award-winning commercial lawyer and partner at the national firm Osler. After struggling with mental health early in his career, he's become a champion for mental health at his firm. Jan and I discuss his challenges, the treatments that helped him get back on track, and his new passion for promoting well-being in his community. My second guest is Bree Buchanan, also a lawyer and the co-chair of the National Task Force on Lawyer Well-Being in the U.S. The task force has shed some light on the high rates of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, among other things, in the legal profession, and also published a report called The Path to Lawyer Well-Being, Practical Recommendations for Positive Change. I spoke with Bree about the research, the task force's recommendations, and her own personal story of how she got inspired to do this work. I met Bree and Yan when I spoke with them on a panel at a conference this past summer. And I was really moved, actually, by their authenticity and their engagement with what I perceive to be a very serious and complex problem. I've seen many lawyers in my private practice and have done consulting work with several law firms, so I'm aware of a very entrenched culture in the field, and it's a culture that values hard work, financial rewards, and sometimes status, often at the expense of personal health and well-being. And the scary data on mental illness in this population speaks to the magnitude of the problem. And yet, the culture really does seem to be changing, thanks to people like Bree and Yan. It's an inspiring story of transformation and resilience, and I wanted to share it with you on the podcast. Before we get to the interviews, I just wanted to mention that if you feel that you need some support uh, for some of the mental health problems that we discuss in this podcast, or if you feel that your organization needs a partner in creating a human-centered culture, please reach out to Mindspace at info at mindspacewellbeing.com. And here's my interview with Jan Besner and then Bree Buchanan. Jan Besner, welcome to the Mindspace podcast. Thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure. The pleasure is all mine and presumably uh, the listeners as well as we get into the really interesting topic today. Um, Jan, can you just tell us uh, what you do right now and uh, how you got into what you do. So I am a um, lawyer and partner at the national law firm called Osler Hoskin Harcourt LLP. Um, We are a leading national law firm uh, specializing in the corporate commercial space. Maybe we can uh, kind of transition over to kind of the important theme of the day here, which is the whole issue of well-being in the legal profession. And I know you're very interested in it and you're something of a uh, champion at Osler. Uh, Maybe you can tell us how you got into that, how that interest developed for you. Well-being, mental health, balance is something that's near and dear to me simply because uh, like many, when I started out in private practice, I struggled with it. A lot of hours, a lot of pressure, you you may have been someone who, or at least me, was who may have excelled in school, but then you're in a high-performing, uh, high-achieving work environment uh, with everyone who finished first, second, third in their class, and with leading minds in their respective fields who, you know, excel at speeds and at at rhythms, and who who juggle schedules, and who are satisfying demands both external and internal, both with family. That can be that can be both motivating, of course, and, and awe-inspiring, and you want to emulate that and you want to be like them, but can at times be quite overwhelming. And so, and that's, that's anyone who comes in even keel in terms of their mood. 
will will see and recognize that. I'm programmed a little bit differently. I mean, I've uh, having done quite a bit of self awareness and soul searching over my time. Um, I do know that I'm someone who traditionally has suffered from irrational guilt and excessive anxiety. And so facing a challenge as daunting as that in private practice um, and the demands that come with it, I will react and my style will be react to, to feel a little bit of an, to, to feel anxiety and the levels can depend. When it's only later on in life, I'm approaching 40, that you realize that that's just how I react. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm scared of the challenge or I'm not willing to to deal with it. But when you're in your early 20s and all you want to do is please and satisfy and accomplish both for yourself and for those you're working for, it's hard to kind of filter it through and stay focused. Through the last 15 years of my practice, yes, you you become a little bit more um, seasoned and you know what to expect when something huge comes in. And so you react differently. But being more aware of triggers of why you feel what you feel and what you can do to make yourself feel better is something that over the course of my career, I've become a lot more aware of, become a lot more proactive in, in responding to those triggers that would either be negative in terms of my reaction to, uh, you know, big work projects, tough deadlines, um, a testy client. Um, I've become more, so to answer your, your question, I became more aware of my reactions and being a lot more proactive in how I would respond to what is already a very demanding job coupled with, you know, personal life, which you need to have. And uh, over time, as I've become more of a advisor slash mentor, even though I still, you know, seek out mentorship and, and advisors from, from my seniors, um, you know, I just don't want people to go through necessarily the same stresses I went through because I now have the benefit of the information and benefit of hindsight and perspective that maybe someone who's just finished school doesn't necessarily have. Would you feel comfortable talking about what you actually went through? What, what exactly uh, did you experience? Well, I would, you know, in my first year um, of practice, uh, you know, I, I worked an extreme amount of hours with a lot of deadlines that were externally set and that were hard, um, like hard deadlines. And I realized that, you know, not having a sense of control, and I find a lot of lawyers in private practice, we're all kind of type A. We all like to control and, and uh, have control over our schedules, control over what we're doing. You know, not necessarily knowing what's coming next can be a source of stress. And for me, that was a massive one. So the unknown would, would cause me, you know, massive anxiety. Okay, well, I've done this task, well, then what's next? You know, when, when am I going to be leaving? You know, it's, it's, I've done so many nights that, you know, past midnight, but what's next? Or I've worked so many weekends in a row. Or more importantly, you know, now I've sent this back. Well, how uh, am I done with this file? Or there's, is there going to be more? I had, I had issues dealing with that. That would cause me, you know, a, a level of anxiety that I think, was, which clearly was not, I guess, usual or normal for, for others. Um, but the way I just explained it to you now was not something I was aware of necessarily at the time. In part, maybe that was youth and slash immaturity or naivete to what I was starting at in terms of the career. But I also think in part, it's, it's really just uh, not having that sense of control or feeling that you have a hold on to what's going on and, and, and just accepting that this is the type of work you're in, try and breathe a little bit better and just enjoy it as opposed to always wanting to know, you know, what's next. How did you kind of get back on track? What did you, what resources did you turn to, to, to make yourself feel a little bit more stable and on top of things? The hardest part about being in that darkness, for lack of a better way to describe it, is um, you know you're not feeling right. You know you're not, you know, getting up and 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 attacking the day the way you have in the past, and and 
and you're feeling a massive weight, emotional and otherwise, on on the simplest of tasks, whether it's getting dressed, whether it's you know going to work, making coffee, something like that. Um, and if it wasn't for either close friends, uh, I guess particularly uh, who I was seeing at the time, um, who had opened me up to the idea of therapies, I don't know that I would have thought of, I, w- I don't know that I would have been open to that idea because, you know, it's when we think of therapies, whether it's counseling, whether it's medication or, or other things, it, it, until it, I guess at that time, it was a very foreign taboo kind of concept um, or, or a form of assistance to, to go after. Um, I was introduced to someone that I could speak to, um, you know, a counselor who uh, was within, I guess, a close network of, of someone who was close to me at the time. So that was an easy introduction to that. And that was the that was I guess the first step, just being able to put out verbally, you know, what I was feeling, what I was thinking, you know, what were my struggles, and that was incredibly helpful because I think in in my first year of practice with all the struggles of of what I was dealing with, um, part of it for sure was, you know, the demands of the profession, and part of it is my programming. And, and that's not something you know how you're going to react to in, until you're faced with it, or at least I wasn't. Um, and, and in going to therapy weekly and, and having, you know, uh, proper inward reflection and discussions about why I react to how I react, why I feel what I feel, you know, what are the triggers uh, to certain my feelings, um, you know, that helped me become a lot more aware and you know and then with the therapist and you, you get tools you know i mean it's i'm sure this is something you you assist your clients with as well is is you know how to cope and i did that for for many years um and and that was incredibly helpful it, it helped me learn a lot it helped me gain a lot more self-awareness on on my programming for lack of a better expression really like how am i wired you know what makes me feel this way or anticipating, you know, a new challenge that'll be coming, I'll be able to anticipate how I'm going to react to it emotionally and know that it's, um, you know, not as even keel as I'd want to, but I guess the awareness makes it lessens the blow. Um, so that, that was incredibly helpful. And, and I was quite apprehensive to the idea at first, simply because, you know, I, I didn't realize to what extent it was common. I didn't realize to what extent, um, you know, it shouldn't be something that I, I should be ashamed of. You know, quite frankly, now it's something I champion. I, I think everybody should have that kind of outlet. Um, you know, I, I think at the time I thought, you know, maybe I should be speaking to a family member or to a friend. But what I really appreciated about therapy was the objectivity of it and the perspective. You know, I think going into it, I thought, well, this person's not going to care about me. So how are they being able to give me the proper advice? But it was quite the opposite. It's I think they're, they're actually very invested and are coming at it from a, a, a place of without bias. And I was able to see things a lot clearer when it came to my personal relationships, my family, uh, and quite frankly, my job and how to, you know, how to attack those challenges and how to deal with different people within uh, my workplace and how to deal with my work tasks. Many people who start to feel this way, whether, you know, whether you mentioned sort of being in a dark place, whether they're feeling depressed or anxious or at risk for a burnout or any of these things, there is this fear that I come across a lot with my clients that um, this is kind of irreversible. And I'm never going to be able to get to perform again. I'm never going to be able to handle the emotional demands of my job. But you went there and then kind of came out on the other side and, and you're now an award-winning lawyer, which is uh, incredible. So, it, it, you know, just the, the sort of trajectory of it that we hit adversity and um, we struggle and we find tools when we come out on top. And it seems like it even 
um, produced for you an additional kind of layer of purpose and meaning in your job? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, but it's not, you know, it's a day to day thing, Joe. Um, it's not, you know, I can't say, you know, when these expressions came out on top, uh, you know, I think what, you know, my, my, my struggle with, um, you know, anxiety, uh, and, you know, and it's, and it's been diagnosed, you know, I'm a depressed person and, you know, depression is, is just like any other, any other, uh, I guess, uh, disease or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the way mine is expressed is through anxiety, you know, and therapy worked for a while and, and you have to keep at it and you have to keep using the tools that, that you, that you get, um, you know, that you're given, you got to work at it and it doesn't necessarily go away. It, 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 it gets tempered and I think it becomes dormant at times, you know, um, um, you know, what I would say though also is that as it being a continual process is that, you know, at, at some point, um, because of time constraints and also quite frankly, because, you know, I, I felt that for me anyways, it, I was feeling the pain that I was feeling th- th- more than what therapy was giving back to me to counteract it. Um, you know, whatever breathing ex- exercises I was given, uh, and having those sessions wasn't enough, you know? And so then that's when in talking with my therapist and in talking with my doctor, that's when I, you know, we start thinking about medication and, you know, thank goodness for pharmaceutical companies to be able to treat this stuff because, you know, that for me was a game changer. Um, and something I'm, I still do today. Um, you know, and again, something that one, was especially me was very apprehensive about at first what are the side effects what's it going to do when i finally found i guess when you know after after trial and error and finally finding you know the 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 proper dosage and the proper medication um there were no side effects there were no negative um or cons if you will it was just final, it was just relief. I, I, I do appreciate the nuance there um, that it's anxiety or depression is not um, this, uh, it's not a moment of adversity that you triumph over and then you never have to think about again. Um, and your experience is reflected in the science, which says more and more, we, we understand more and more that mood and anxiety problems are episodic. They're a kind of, a, in a way, a, a chronic health condition that we need to maintain a certain amount of fitness around to um, enjoy a good quality of life. But coming back to um, what I was saying earlier, you were in a dark place and now you're not. And there, there's, there's a bunch of, there's a structure in place and, you know, part of that is uh, pharmacological and part of that was the support you got from ther- uh, from a therapist and all that so it is, it is possible to be in that dark place and then come out of it um, and even excel and thrive in your job. And it does, it, it will depend on and require a certain level of maintenance to keep what you achieved. But many people don't know that when they're in the dark place. So your, your story is very inspiring in that sense. Well, thanks. I mean, I, you know, I don't, the last thing I want to come off or come across on or come across as is, you know, anything greater than Mr. Joe, everybody. And sorry to use your name in that, but <laughs> I just meant, you know, I'm not more special or stronger than, than anyone else. Um, but, in, but when you're dealing with that, with those problems in your mind by yourself, you do feel like you're the only one in the world suffering. And mm-hmm. that I remember at the time, you know, that was the worst feeling ever because it's a very alone feeling to have. So, you know, if coming out and, and talking about this now, you know, can, can ring some bells to those who are, who are feeling that or are going through some things or, or at risk thereof, you know, I, that's, that's the wonderful thing about technology today and also just about how we're destigmatizing all of these things is to let people know, no, if you, if you start feeling a little bit, don't, don't wait to suffer. 
because there's no point. There's so many tools now to, to, to feel better and it's, it's good to feel better. So you did mention that it's not always obvious for lawyers and I'm assuming it's not just in private practice. Um, it's part of the culture of the profession to not necessarily come forward and be open uh, and be vulnerable um, to one's boss or colleagues. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the culture, your perspective on why that is part of the culture and maybe what you think we could do about it. I think what's interesting about that statement, Joe, is that it's changing and that I don't think that it's, that may have been the case. And, you know, the reason I told the story earlier about my first year in practice um, is that I think that was true. I think that was the culture, but I don't think that was necessarily, by the way, um, exclusive to lawyers and private practice. What's nice is that I think it's changing. It's changing simply because um, myself and people who uh, who have maybe had started 15 years ago and who have evolved uh, or grown up in the profession, now we're talking about this. We're doing conferences about these issues now. We're talking about this. Leaders in the industry are, you know, 15 to 25 years out of school and so are looking at it differently. They're not saying, well, that's just how it was always done and that's how we're going to continue to do it. Uh, mental health and well-being is something that is being spoken about proactively as opposed to reactively, waiting for an employee or um, you know, a staff member to, to have something bad come upon them and have to, to treat it. Um, you know, we, like we at Osler, we celebrated Mental Health Week. That was back in May. You know, we brought in a speaker to, to speak to the entire firm on uh, lawyers and well-being, substance abuse, mental health disorders. You know, what are the warning signs? How can you live a better life? You know, how do you prioritize you know, your personal life uh, and make sure you get some sort of balance within a profession, by the way, and a workplace that inherently will be imbalanced. And I think you have to know that going in. But that imbalance is something that people like myself, you know, do enjoy because there are benefits to it. You get to, you know, you get to do great things and work with really smart people on really fun projects. That being said, there's an expense to that. And so you need to be able to take a step away and, and recoup. But we are being proactive about it. Um, you know, just again, at my firm, we've got a 24-7 employee assistance hotline that's completely anonymous where if people are going through things, they now have a voice to call. You know, we pay for that, but nobody knows about it. Uh, nobody knows who calls, I'm saying. It's completely anonymous. It's private. So therefore, there's, there's, there really should be no reason for anyone not trying to uh, reach out and get help. It's an external provider who provides it. I'm sure we are not the only law firm in the country that is doing this. Um, but that's just an example of what traditionally you would say big law would be not necessarily uh, paying attention to. But And so that's on the macro level. I know personally, I'm not the only one either who will check in consistently with the associates I work with to make sure, you know, how are you doing? Are you overworked? Do you have enough work? You know, are you stressed? Like we have to talk about this stuff more. It has to become more of uh, a way of being as much as, you know, did you get this done on time? Um, because no one's going to get anything done on time if they're not in the proper, you know, state to do it. So I think it's environmental change in terms of people on the ground have to, you know, make that a part of how they are on a day-to-day -day basis. But at least we're putting in, you know, structures, whether it's through having, you know, a mental awareness week and having an assistance line uh, and having resources that those who may not want to, you know, be upfront about uh, these issues uh, can go to. And, you know, to be quite honest, me coming on this program and opening up about my personal um, experiences when to, I know for a fact, to some, I come off as being this Teflon you know, well-balanced, never too stressed uh, person. Whereas my wife would be laughing her ass off right now if she heard <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, at work, they would only see someone who's just even keel and always happy and always has his stuff together. 
uh, I think it's important for them to know that no, that's that's not necessarily the case. That and, and that it's okay because it's you know just like any muscle, you work it out to keep it fit. Uh, I think the same thing goes when it comes to your brain and and your behavior and your feelings. Very cool, Yan. Um, I have a lot of respect for the leadership you're taking in this space, and and I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking about your experiences and opening up in a way that. I can imagine feels vulnerable and you're really modeling that for the students and the, the young lawyers coming into the firm. So thanks a lot for doing it. How can people um, sort of keep in touch with you? Do you want to just tell us about your uh, social media presence or um, anything about your practice? Sure. Um, well, so social media is more on the, on the personal family fun front um, and also the different philanthropic um efforts I'm involved in. So I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter at, at Yam Besner, all one word. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to uh, follow more of the lawyerly things I do, um, as well as uh, my profile on Oster.com, all very accessible through the Google machine. Hello, Bree. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks. Great to be here. All right, I'm I'm so I feel so lucky to have you here and I'm really looking forward to asking you all my questions here. So maybe we'll start with the first one, which is um to tell us what you do. Um from what I could tell, you sort of have three different jobs. You're first of all, you're a lawyer. Um you're the director of the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. You're the chair of the ABA Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs. And you're the co-chair of the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing, which I will definitely ask you about. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about each of those jobs? Yeah, I will. And I'm always amazed if I hear somebody say, what are all the different hats that I wear? It's actually a little bit embarrassing. So (laughs) I'll start with my day job. I'm the director of the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. And so the shorthand is we're kind of like an EAP for lawyers, judges, and law students in the state of Texas um, to maybe having some behavioral health issues. And so that's what I do for the day. And then um, also the American Bar Association's Commission on Lawyers Assistance Programs. So there's uh, one of those lawyers assistance programs in every state of the United States and and also in Canada. And so we come together regularly to support each other in our work. And then there's also the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing. And I've been a um, co-chair of that entity for two years. Okay. Uh, Yeah, let's get into that one. So what exactly is the National Task Force? Yeah, it's a, I like to call it, like we are a rogue band of individuals who really care passionately about lawyer well-being. And I have to, I need to define that word because when I say well-being, that's a real global term I'm going to use throughout. Um, and we're talking about helping lawyers who are already experiencing depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, and sort of helping them overcome and deal with, go into recovery for those impairments. And it's also looking at how we can support lawyers um, who are really not thriving in their profession and have just sort of a general malaise in their life and are not happy. Um, So really have something to offer everybody in the profession. So those of us who work on this on a national level came together a couple of years ago Um, commandeered an empty conference room at the American Bar Association because we're all already there wearing, you know, the chair of this or the commissioner of that. We're all already in one location. And the reason we got together on that day in August of 2016 is two big reports had just been published that made um, it so clear and undeniable that the state of lawyer well-being was dire. Uh, Prior to this, we didn't really have good studies or statistics. We certainly had what we, the anecdotal evidence of what had had gone on. So what these studies show, there's one that was done across the United States, 3,000 lawyers, and showed incredibly high rates of um, alcohol abuse, substance abuse, 
high, high rates of depression and anxiety disproportionate to the general population. The same year, a study was done and published of law students across the United States. Um, lots of students involved, really reliable results. And what we saw very clearly was that these issues are starting in law school. If you compare the rates of these impairments of law students with people in the general population, you can start to see that there's something about the experience of entering into the legal profession that has a, almost a pathologizing effect. Anxiety goes up, substance abuse goes up, depression goes up. And one of the most concerning things out of these two studies that we saw that really turned things on its head is that the younger the lawyer, the greater the rate of impairment or problem, regardless of what type it was. And we used to think that people that did this work the longest would have a higher rate of problems. And it was a huge eye-opener to see it's actually the youngest members of the profession who are struggling the most. So all of us who are coming at this from different parts of the law who are the, the EAP, the LAPs of the profession, the lawyers' assistance programs, the people who regulate the profession, the, the bar council, the disciplinary folks, um, across the board, we saw this and we knew, okay, we have a moment here. We have an opportunity because the data is in. It's undeniable. We cannot just sit here and fail to take action and let these studies go on a shelf somewhere because we know that lawyers and law students and judges are suffering. Um, they truly are. And um, I can just sort of as a point of like, how does that impact the uh, society in general? When you've got people who are attending to the judicial system and our system of laws and our access to justice who are not doing well in their work, it affects all members of society. So it's there's really important things here, big stuff. And so we came together in that, that conference room in 2016 and sat around a table. And um, I guess we're really blessed to have some big thinkers there um, and some bold thinkers. And we decided that we were going to use this opportunity to do nothing short of create, creating a movement to change the legal culture and how it takes care of its own how it treats the lawyers and the law students who come into this profession. So to institute a culture change and a real shift in how that work is done, we knew would not be easy. So the first thing that we did is started bringing in outside of that room, who are the other leaders of the profession, are the other leaders of the stakeholders who have an interest in this and bring them to the table. So we started having conference calls every couple of weeks and then broke into work groups and started looking for each of the stakeholders within the profession, what do they need to do to bring about a culture change within their area? And then we all got together and decided what are some recommendations for the entire legal profession and recommendations for each stakeholder. And when I say stakeholder, I'm talking about judges. And then another stakeholder are the legal educators, the law schools. Another would be um, the people who regulate and manage the profession. Another are the legal employers. So we brought together and did a report in nine months and brought that forward to his power, different powers that be. And it's one of those things where it was the, the right thing, the right teaching at the right time, and doors just started to open. And now the, in a very short period of time, the legal profession is starting to really look at this closely. Um, for example, uh, just in January of this year, me and the other co-chair got to take this work in front of the Conference of Chief Justices. So that, let me set the scene for you. This is a, a hotel conference room with uh, the Chief Justice of e each state's Supreme Court. So a pretty small group, but um, uh, really <laughs> influential to say the least. 
And my co-chair and I got to talk to them about this report and ask them, you are the leaders of the profession in your state. You're responsible for the well-being of the, the members of that profession. Please take this back to your state and charge the stakeholders there for developing a plan to address what is really a woeful state of affairs with in regards to the profession and lawyer well-being in general. And just in the um, seven months' time since that pre- we gave that presentation, there are 18 states where there is some sort of uh, – large task force that's looking at across the profession within the state, what can be done? So this whole, I can say at this point in time, it really is a movement. When we sat in that room two years ago, we didn't know if anybody would pay attention to us. We kind of laughed at ourselves at the audacity. We didn't know certainly if anybody would read the report. But I'd say that that the movement has been ignited. Um, I went back and was giving a follow-up report to that same group of justices just a few days ago, and I told them that we've ignited um, what feels like sometimes a rocket around this, and now our work is to make sure that that rocket is not actually a firecracker that's going to sputter out. We really are working to try to sustain this movement. So it's, it's exciting times within the profession to look at this. That's such an incredible story. Why do you think this work has been so well received? Um, why do you think the timing is right? What's going on that well-being is now a topic that people are really taking seriously? It was a, It's a confluence of a variety of factors. I don't know all of them, but I'll tell you what I think are a few. First, that was essential was to have those studies. We really had to have the hard data that was reliable and published in a peer-reviewed journal, which we do, Um, and then have a group of people who are leaders in the different areas around the country come together and really dig in and look at this and provide uh, some, uh, I guess, a some an outline for how to move forward, to give people tools on how to do this. There's some other things that are going on, too. I mean, if you think about it, we're going to change a profession. We knew that it has to be about the bottom line because the law is also it's, it's a business. So the, the, for there to be a real shift, the factors that are going on are, would have to be starting to have an impact on the legal culture and law firms bottom line. And so here is how that's happening. When so many of the firms are seeing that um, the younger generation are not going to put up with being treated as chattel, Um, as the older generation has, like, come in and we're going to tie you to the desk and work you until there's nothing left. For generations, decades upon decades, lawyers, that's the, the life that they have led, and they've been willing to undergo that. The young lawyers that are coming into the practice are not going to endure that. So what is happening with the big firms who drive the culture, are seeing that number one, they can't get the best minds, you know, in regards to recruiting the top talent, they can't get them to walk in the door. Or if they get them to walk in the door, they cannot get them to stay. So in the legal profession, in the first two or three years of a lawyer's career, they're operating for that firm for a huge loss because the, the firm's pouring in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into bringing them on, into onboarding them. What's happening in droves is that young lawyers are coming in, getting that training, and then they leave because they're not going to put up with that anymore. And the firm, the law firms are really taking notice because there is a big brain drain on the in the practice. They can't recruit the talent, retain the talent, um, and it's costing them large sums of money. And we so we got their attention right now. 
And I think that's that's a key point as well. So it's a confluence of, of those things. I'm sure there are others. You mentioned that doors are being opened and you have people's attention. Are there any other signs that you're having impact? I'm seeing coverage in the, uh, the professions, um, media outlets. There's a lot of attention being paid to the subject of well-being. You see pretty regular coverage and articles that come out about law firms that are taking up different initiatives. And a year ago, you wouldn't find articles about that. So that's one sign. Another sign, like I said, the different states that are starting to take up these initiatives. For example, I can speak to in Texas, where I reside. The chief came back from that presentation in January, our chief, and called me and some people over, other people from the bar here, and said, well, what are we going to do in Texas? And so since that time, there's a we put together a round table on lawyer well-being and pulled together the heads of each stakeholder to what was a round table. And we're looking at what do we need to be doing in Texas? That would never have been done before this report came out. It's just laying the groundwork and the priming the pump so that these things can take place. And more and more of these things are taking place around the country. All right. So I, I really want to get into like the recommendations and the specifics around what changes you're trying to implement. But before we do that, I think it'd be nice to maybe bring it down to a bit more of a human level. You've heard uh, the clip uh, from our mutual friend, Jan Besner. What impression did that create for you? It's a story. The one that he told of his very first year, first years in the profession, it's one that repeats itself over and over across both Canada and the United States with young lawyers. How do you acclimate to a profession that is so hard driving? And we all hit the door actually of law school and certainly with our, with our job of being type A personalities who are perfectionists, who want to please our superiors and our clients. And I will work ourselves to very much the detriment of our own well-being and the well-being act of our families too. So what he said sounds just par for the course for what young lawyers new to the profession are experiencing. Um, the, the issue about having to work such um, extreme hours, I think that's some language that he used, the pressures around that, and the uncertainty of the practice of law. And so what I talk to young lawyers, and I tell law students about this too, the law, the practice of law, it is about an, being adversarial. It's about representing your client against somebody else. So over the course of that, which can be years, there is uncertainty. It's a part of the profession. High stress is part of the profession that's never going to change. High stakes. We're dealing with people with their the most urgent issues sometimes of their entire life that has landed in our laps and we're being looked to to fix that. That's not going to change about the law profession. So a lot of what I do in my day job and also what is happening uh, as part of this sort of well-being push is how do we build up the lawyers so that they can endure this inevitable stress, chronic stress and uncertainty and difficulties that's part of the profession. And quite frankly, over, you know, over lead of your professional life is just life because life is filled with uncertainty and stress and setbacks and losses. So how do we deal with that in a, in a, some of the things that are really being discussed um, across the country now and how to do that and how to put within the hands of individual lawyers the ability to, to deal with this is around resilience and using that, you know, thinking of it through that lens. How do we improve the resilience of lawyers to be able to deal with the inherent adversities and setbacks of practice and life? And so giving them tools to be able to do this, which I will say meditation and mindfulness is, is a, an automatic go-to. 
out of my toolkit for my personal life, but also in something that I try to teach lawyers as well. But other things about, you know, there may be mindfulness and meditation. There are practices around gratitude, uh, positive positivity, um, a variety of skill sets that can can lift one up to to be able to better endure what is thrown at us on a daily basis. Another thing um, I've heard Yan uh, talk about is, especially when he was younger, feeling a little reluctant to go to talk to somebody um, <clears throat> about what he's going through, and that could be just a peer or a superior to try to get some support. And I, of course, uh, recognized that that was a, an important finding in one of the 2016 studies as well, that um, young lawyers are loath to make themselves vulnerable in that way. I wonder uh, if you're seeing that uh, in, in many of the stories you're hearing as well. Absolutely. It's across the board. You look at the study for law students and they won't ask for help. It's a super hyper competitive environment and they can't let anybody else know that they're struggling or there's a weakness. And we take on the persona of being a warrior on behalf of our clients. And so we can't show you know, a chink in that armor uh, out of fear. Um, and the fear is there because we're, the fear is that we will lose face, that we will lose some piece of our reputation, which is the most important thing that a lawyer has. And why are we afraid? The reason that we're afraid is that there is still, and this blows my mind, but in 2018, so much stigma and shame around these behavioral health disorders, such as depression or a substance use disorder, that these professionals won't step forward and ask for help. And where that gets, you know, where the, the rubber meets the road, the sort of the praxis of this is when I'm sitting here at my desk and I answer this phone and a lawyer has um, let their life become so um, out of control because of severe, de severe depression or maybe an alcohol use disorder. They have lost loves, you know, their partners. They, uh, they've lost um, businesses and they still will not ask for help. And so often it's not until they're at the just at the end before they're willing to break out of that fear um, and call and ask for help. And that, that's something that really, really breaks my heart. And it motivates me so much to do this work. Um, there is no shame in having a problem. There is no shame in struggling with incredibly difficult professions. Um, there are so many people that struggle in that way. Uh, but just that we, are, we're all, we all have to be tough and warriors, and we don't talk about it with each other, so we think that we're only one and sit in our little silo and suffer until things are almost completely spun out of control. So a big piece of this report, the work that I do, is about encouraging people to ask for help if you need it and making the rest of the community okay with these problems to make it okay and normalize it to ask for help to talk about these things um, out in the open. So, you know, Joe, one of the things that I, I do a lot of times now and more and more I do it is I, I want to tell people that I deal with these issues. I was just about to ask you about that. I yeah. yeah, and I usually do it, you know, I wait until I've done the introduction with all the hats and kind of exert some authority or maybe like, oh, maybe she knows what she's talking about. And then after that, hopefully building some credibility for myself, I come in and I say, and I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict. And I deal with a history of depression. And with all those things, I have accomplished these things, wear all these hats, and give back to my community. And we need to be able to look at people who have whatever the, the issue is and see them as assets to our profession, that they, we, bring a specific worldview that 
everyone can benefit from. And, and Joe, I'm happy to talk to you as much or as little about my, um, my own personal story. So whatever would be helpful to others. I'd be curious to hear how lawyers or other members of the legal profession respond when you expose yourself like that. When that happens, when I do, or when any other person makes themselves vulnerable, there is, um, it is a really poignant moment. Um, it's like the air is still. I can do this in front of a group of 500 lawyers at a continuing legal education deal. And, you know, you're up there talking rant, rant, rant. <laughs> and people are, you know, they used to, be, used to read the newspapers and now people are with their phone or tablet or whatever. And when somebody gets up and it starts to open their heart and become real and genuine people there's just something unique about that moment and you know the uh, eyes come up and people are really present in the room at that moment and i feel like i'm heard and i feel when i've been in the room when other people are sharing their story i know that they are being heard as well and it is a powerful moment uh, it can be transformative for people listening, the person who's saying it as well, but the people listening to um, that what can bring about a shift. And I've seen that happen repeatedly where people come up afterwards and, and they have been touched and they want to share their story. Um, so it's, it is um, a really wonderful thing to do it's so helpful it is so hard to do it's still hard for me to do it's it's um, you know it's very um uh feels really raw to do it but i I do it now because i know how important it is i'm obviously uh given my profession familiar with the change in atmosphere in a room whether it's individual or group or whatever when things get real. I know that from the lawyers I work with, part of what makes that feel risky and treacherous is the possibility that there are people in the room saying, oh my God, keep it together. And what's wrong with you? And you're just weak and sort of you know, playing the tape of that narrative. Are there not people in the room still thinking that way? I believe that there are. And people engage in defense mechanisms and play old tapes and um, are not comfortable with the, that sort of self-revelatory experience and don't think it's there's a place in a CLE program. And I've gotten beyond that. Um, I know that when I am saying my story, that there are people that are going to be uncomfortable. And I'm okay with that. Um, I get up there knowing that I'm not going to please everybody in the room. But my mission is that if I could get up there and that, and reduce the suffering of somebody in the room or maybe even save a life down the road somewhere, my discomfort and the passing discomfort of somebody in the room because they had to listen to my story, it is well worth it. If you're up for it, I would be curious to hear your story, how you got into uh, the difficulties with substances and your mood and how you got out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you the short version because <laughs> we don't have all that much time. But um, you know, I, I just, to sum a lot of it up, I had a very uncomfortable and painful childhood. And I, like so many people do when they experience that, I found pretty quickly that uh, substances um medicated that pain and that discomfort. And so in high school, it was alcohol. And undergraduate, it was marijuana. I went to law school and it's like, well, better leave the, you know, aside the, the, the illegal drug. And so I turned to what is uh, so sanctioned in the law schools and legal profession, which is alcohol in copious amounts. Um, I had an anxiety disorder by the time I finished my first year of law school. And the go-to for me to deal with that was to drink and drink a lot. 
Um, fast forward through my profession, I, I've done a lot of really cool things. I got to work at Legal Aid and represent victims of domestic violence and really threw myself into some tough, tough areas of the law that brought up stuff for myself. I didn't take care of myself in the best ways. And I continued with that quick, easy fix go to of alcohol and it you know, they say it works until it doesn't it, it doesn't um a lot of times it did make me feel better but it is um in insidious and over time you pour enough alcohol onto somebody who has is genetically predisposed uh because of family history to develop an alcohol use disorder that, that starts to change the brain the actual brain chemistry. And that's what happened with me. And it goes from being something you choose to something you don't really have a choice over. Uh, it took a long time for me to get there, but I definitely got to that point. And uh, through all of that, I'm also, you know, I'm so I'm self-medicating anxiety, I'm self-medicating depression, and covering all of that up. And, it, and at one point it just in my 40s it all started to just um you know it was like the game of jenga you know just things start to just we pull out enough things and it all just comes crumbling down and i i um i lost my marriage and then i lost my job and boy when a lawyer loses their job that's when it really gets your attention and it's terrible but it's the truth um and at that juncture, which is there was my low point, um, some other people need to get to where they've also lost their house, you know. Um, but losing a marriage and losing my job was my bottom. And then I started looking for a way to find out my way out. And I did that through getting into really regular therapy, um, getting on also being on the right medication, getting into a mutual support group that supported my recovery, um, and also getting into uh, a community of meditators. I mean, that really helped save my life as much as anything else in de developing a meditation practice. Um, so I could uh, get real with myself and stabilize my mind. And so I spent some time um, out of work, re, you know, putting myself back together again. And then I was really, truly blessed to be able to get a job here at the Lawyer's Assistance Program. So over the past eight years, I live and breathe recovery. So um, it's, it's an amazingly blessed life and uh, one I could never have imagined. You know, in those dark days back in um, 2009 and 10. So anyway, that's it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. It's, it's, it's a very powerful and very inspiring story. And I'm, I'm just so glad that um, we were able to get you back. And, and now you're doing this amazing work. So um, really, uh, thanks for, for sharing and thanks for for taking on this uh, mission. It's really incredible. Um, maybe you can tell us some of the specifics, some of the recommendations, some of the, the changes you're trying to create on the ground in the profession. So, uh, and I, th I believe this is in the 2017 report that you guys published. Yeah, the 2017, the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing, it's at lawyerwellbeing.net. And um, so we did recommendations that were global, that applied to everybody. And so some of those, the most important things, number one is for the legal to prof profession to acknowledge, realize that it's in trouble, that it's got a problem. And we're in that awakening right now. That's really happening Another thing is that the leaders of the profession develop a national action plan and, a, and the leaders of the profession in states develop a state action plan. When we originally got together, we knew, we made a very conscious decision, this is not going to be a report that tells lawyers individually they need to eat their kale and exercise, right? We know that, we heard that. This is a cultural problem. It's a systemic problem, and it is not going to change until from the very top, top down, there are changes within the profession. So the report is really, and these recommendations are really 
written to the very top leaders. And we're asking them, each of them, to take responsibility for looking within their system of what needs to be changed. We're also asking all leaders within the profession. Maybe you're leader of a team in a law firm. Well, you're a leader in the profession. What can you do to lift up the people in your, on your team and create a more sustainable uh, profession and career and workplace for the people there? So looking at it that way, the other thing that is a global recommendation is around dealing with stigma. Until we get people talking about these issues openly and making it where we just, we put, you know, turn out, turn off the shame. It's 2018. There's no room for that anymore. We've got to talk about these things among ourselves, talk about it openly, um, and make it okay for people to ask for help, make it clear if you're in a at working someplace and you have an alcohol use disorder, being really transparent with those folks. It's like, this is what's going to happen. We have, a, we have a policy in place for you to be able to go and health insurance in place for you to go off and get treatment for this con- medical condition, which is what it is, and come back and reintegrate into the firm. And be clear, Let's. There's, there should be no mystery around this. It's kind of almost like we're back where we were 30 years or so ago with cancer, where it was just clouded, like there's for some reason some element of shame in it. We had to hide it. Um, so those are some those are some of the, the largest ones, and I think addressing those things within the profession, everything else, maybe I'm being a Pollyanna, but everything else will start to follow. I am mindful of the time here. So grateful to have you for for the time that I've had. Before I let you go, is there anything else that um, we haven't covered that you think is important that we get to before we end? If anybody is really struck by the things that we're talking about today, I encourage you to take a look at the National Task Force's website, which is lawyerwellbeing.net, and you can see the report. It's uh, That website's a work in progress, and more things will, will be posted there, but that's a really good place to start and to dig in and learn more about what we're trying to do here in the legal profession. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, and I'll definitely um, post a link to that website uh, on the show notes for this episode. Um, So once again, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I'm truly inspired by the work you're doing, and I wish you uh, all the best success uh, going forward with it. Thank you. All right. Take care, Brie. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. The purpose of this project is to inspire people to cultivate well-being. The science tells us that well-being is best understood as a series of skills and habits that can be learned and practiced. And I hope listening to these episodes helps you move forward on your own path to well-being. If you enjoy listening to the Mindspace podcast, please share your favorite episodes with friends, family, and colleagues. Thanks a lot.